a little early, one minute and 39 seconds, but I would like to invite the four CEOs that have kindly uh, given their time and their uh, being brave to sit on a panel with me. Um, I'm not mean, the questions are prepared, so don't worry. Uh, don't worry for their livelihood and goodness. Um, uh, let's start with um, Adam Goldstein from Archer. Uh, we'll continue with Dirk Hoke from Volocopter. Klaus Rowe from Lilium. And last but not least, uh, Brian Yutko from Whisk. How are you? Thanks. Yes, thank you. I'm not the moderator. I'm like, I need this one. Don't take it. Don't take it. So um, as an FYI, uh, and let me just take this off so that we're good. Um, OK. Congratulations. Not yet. There you go. Perfect. So first of all, thank you. Um, I don't, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, I feel like David Letterman uh, or, or, you know, some of these guys, my guests need no introduction. Um, you all know them. Uh, you all love to give them a hard time. Uh, but at the same time, without them, we, there wouldn't be any future of mobility. So thank you. So in, in, in our panel, we got 40 minutes and we have Slido. So please, if you have questions, go ahead and be mean. It's okay. They decided to come. I didn't force them. Um, but what we want to explore is a little bit talking about you know, everything that is related to adventure mobility. Um, and the interesting part is you know, we have a, a, a very diverse panel. right? We have regional air mobility. We have autonomy. We have urban air mobility on both sides of the ocean. So very interesting to see this. Um, so I would like to start. Um, and, and I asked them to bring one thing that they have never talked about before. So, I mean, I ask, right? So, and then I put them on the spot. Um, so use cases. Let's start by talking about use cases, right? And uh, AAM has many markets. Um, and each one is from a specific use cases. And so tell us a little bit the use case you're concentrating on, why you chose it, um, and how do you see this chosen market develop within this next decade? And Get us started, Adam. All right, thanks, Sergio. I'm Adam Goldstein, uh, founder and CEO at Archer. So at Archer, our goal is to bring a vehicle to market to carry passengers. And we're targeting you know, a pilot plus four passenger vehicle um, with a range of up to 100 miles. But really, the goal is urban air mobility. So think your typical 20 to 40 mile trips that on routes will take you 60, 90, 120 minutes on the ground that we can replace with a flight that's five or 10 minutes. And so we'll target the larger cities to start and specifically looking at um, airport to city centers as great entry into service routes. And the reason that we've done that is we wanted to focus on um, routes that people could easily understand because airports typically have a lot of anxiety built into them because you don't want to be late. And so you'll even add buffers to the you know, likely long commutes that you have to spend going to the airport. So we also know there's known demand and willingness to pay because we've seen it uh, from rideshare. And so by partnering with uh, United Airlines, it enabled us to um, announce several you know, route cities early, start working on them with the airports directly, and then also start to work with the operators on the other side as well. Thank you. Dirk. Yeah, the real story is our founders started to see the first toy drones and they said the multi-copter design is so much more stable than the toy helicopters, so it must work also in bigger. So this is how it started. Um, today, we looked at, again at the market and uh, looking at your market figures, the different studies you show, I think everyone agrees it's huge. Uh, once the vehicles are there, once the certification is there, there are thousands of applications. So we differentiated between the same market as you, regional and urban market. We believe that the urban market is like 60% and 
the regional market is 40%. So we have both designs, but we start with the urban design, so the Volo City, as you have shown, flying, uh, and you can see in the display today at 1.26 uh, p.m. Um, this is the one that we will fly next year in Paris, a little bit bigger. And uh, it is a design that is really optimized for the city. Very low noise profile, very safe. We can lose two motors, we can uh, lose two engines, and we can still safely land and continue. Um, so it's all optimized for city because, as you said, we believe in the in the safety case of the one to the minus nine. We believe that uh, aviation has become the safest modality uh, by keeping these rules, and uh, that's why we fostering on safety, low noise level, and sustainable uh, propulsion. So this is why we we chose electric. Yeah. So we believe this is a, a start. It is. Um, I had an interesting uh, discussion with uh, some of the other CEOs that are not here, and uh, it's all about uh, yeah, starting crawling and then walking and then running. So it's not it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. But we we think we are well on track. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, we are clearly a bit the outlier. That is what you can tell from our design, uh, which looks a bit different. Uh, our model clearly is regional uh, transportation, and uh, we want to do re regional transportation CO2-free, for many people achievable and affordable. Uh, that's why our aircraft is a, big, a bit bigger. Uh, so we have six passengers on board uh, who have to come up for the cost of one pilot, and uh, also striving for a longer range. And uh, we are starting off with 175 kilometers, as everybody knows. However, the built-in efficiency, the aero efficiency of the aircraft will yield with upcoming battery generations in much longer ranges. Typical uh, applications would be point-to-point -point connections. It could also be last miles, or la last miles plural, after long-haul flights, international flights. But uh, we, we'd rather look in connecting big cities. And when you see our yesterday's announcement around the Hong Kong Bay, uh, with our entry into service configuration, 175 kilometers of operational range, uh, we would have a coverage in the area of the larger Hong Kong Bay of about press release, I think, says 85 million passengers or people. Uh, it's, it's even a bit more. Uh, and all people who, who can afford a flight in this aircraft, and we are designing the aircraft also for lowest operating costs. So because when operating costs are too high, you have a, a natural barrier for, for democratization. It just, does, it just doesn't help. Yeah, so low operating cost, uh, high transport capacity. Transport capacity is expressed in number of passengers and in range. Thank you. Right. Super. The, um, the WISC use case is passenger carrying autonomous mobility. So we are direct to autonomous. We're certifying an autonomous airplane today because we think that it's the key in this industry to safety and to scalability. So that's why we're doing it. We'll fly the airplane on missions up to 100 miles. We'll fly it intercity. We intend to fly between airports. We intend to fly between regions uh, as, uh, as we can up to, that, up to that mileage. But we'll do so autonomously. Um, we have no concept for our airplane to ever have a pilot on board. Uh, we're designing all of the necessary onboard and offboard systems to enable that, and we're certifying it today. And we're certifying it at very high levels of safety today, levels of safety that you would see in large commercial transport, but that we're bringing down into the small airplane market for the first time. So we're really excited about that. We've designed the airplane to carry passengers because we believe that by designing the airplane to carry passengers, we could very easily use it for other use cases. So we've considered up front how we would use the aircraft for uh, cargo type missions, and we'll be in position to be able to execute those types of missions if and when we want to enter those markets. But we'll always do it in an autonomous way with an offboard supervisor that's supervising the aircraft at very high levels of safety and, uh, and an ability to scale in a way that we think meets the market economics here that are required. Thank you. So now let's, uh, let's switch gears. So let's talk about speed to market, right? Everyone's got their own ideas. It's important to be first, who cares? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we know that developed is vital. It's not a walk in the park, right? I've seen pictures of you guys five years ago, and you look way younger. No, <laughs> um, so it, it's an important metric, right? And often, often we hear about this minimum viable product, right? That's kind of like counterintuitive. Instead of 
you say, I want the best product I can ever have. But there is importance to being able to come to market. So when it comes to this minimum viable product, are you implementing this strategy? If not, why? Guide us through your approach. And then last but not least, what is the impact of the regulations from both sides of the ocean? Uh, and I know that you guys are trying to build a phone line so that they can talk to each other, right? Uh, Brian, why don't you get us started? Yeah, so um, the good thing is we started in 2010. So we've been at this for a while. Um, you know, we're, we've been through five generations of aircraft at WISC and through its predecessor uh, companies. And we're really excited about the technology development and all the configuration learning that's gone into that work. So we feel that we've worked through a place where we understand the technology, the, con the technology's matured to a point from an electric power standpoint and from an automation standpoint, and from what we've learned as part of uh, being part of the Boeing family and some of the, the, the various companies within the family, um, what it takes to bring an autonomous aircraft to market. We've gone through that process and we're at the point now where we're certifying an airplane. So what we're building now is not a technology demonstrator, it is a product. We have an active FAA certification program right now where we're working through all the issue papers that are associated with bringing a product like this to market. We're also working through the operational approvals for bringing a product like this to market. We know that we're not going to be first to market. Um, in fact, we're rooting for all the others on this stage and many of the others that are in the crowd, uh, I see Joe Ben hiding over there, to get certified because we think that's great for our whole market. Our only ask is that, is that that's done safely. And I know that everyone's doing this safely and, and we're really excited for Dirk and the team at, at the Olympics next year. We think that's awesome. And so we are not rushing to market. We do not believe that speed to market for us is critical. We want to be right to market. We think autonomy is the right thing for this market for safety and scalability. And so we want to go directly there and we want to do it in a safe way. So we're really excited for the market to develop. We don't believe that it's a winner take all market. We think there will be lots of players. And so we're really excited about that. That's on the point on speed. On the last point that you made there in EASA and, and FAA, we have an FAA program. We do not have uh, right now an EASA program, but we've taken a lot of lessons from the SC VTOL EASA work. We think there's a lot of deep insights in there. We're designing the aircraft to have a, a catastrophic hazards at 10 to the minus nine, um, no single points of failure, delay, et cetera, et cetera. We believe that by working with the FAA, but having a line of sight towards EASA, we will have a view towards transferability, global transferability of the first commercial autonomous airplane. And that's what we're all about, safety and scalability. Thank you. Klaus. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I, I can only subscribe to what you are saying. And I really appreciate uh, on the other side of the Atlantic to have the same view on, on safety like we have here in Europe. Uh, Lilium, in fact, um, is one of the younger companies. And when you talk to time to market, I would say we are also one of the fastest. Uh, Lilium is just eight years old, and about the first five years has been used just for R&T. And people may not know that we are currently, the, the two aircraft we are flying uh, in, in Spain, in our flight test center, they are 60 to 70% of the scale of our type conforming aircraft that we are building now. Uh, but it's the fifth generation of aircraft which is flying, and everything which was made before was exploration of flight physics, aircraft integration, propulsion, energy management that has all been development, uh, developed uh, in the first, I would say, five years of the company to set the foundations. We have then in 2020 elected to start the design and we are now three years into the design of our type conforming aircraft, clearly with the intention to get this to market, not as an MVP, but as a real product because we want to get traction in the market, uh, which we believe we will only get if we are putting something out there that our customers can make money with. And for sure, in terms of, of cash profile for the company, we start very flat and it will then be uh, steepening up very much. Uh, we are going to get there now uh, very soon. Uh, you may have seen we have in the wind tunnel, we just, uh, or we are in the process, but we do it since a couple of weeks. We have the 40% scale model, wind tunnel test model flying. Uh, which is set by the wind tunnel operator, which is the largest wind tunnel in Europe. It's the most sophisticated test they have ever made because it's also propelled, so we have the engines on. Uh, we believe our approach uh, was very prudent, starting off with technology development, uh, but then turning it 
into a real product. Also, our first flight will be a meant first flight. We are not wasting time, money, and energy with a remote control type conforming aircraft. And then going within five and five and a half years from the first start of the drawing of the design of the aircraft to TC, getting fast into the market and penetrate the market. Thank you. Dirk. Yeah, it's a long journey. The um, Volocopter founders, they did the first flight in 2011, the famous flight on a yoga ball. And they made it to the first uh, aircraft in 2013. And then it took another five years to get to the 2X, which you see flying here, where we fly manned, unmanned, everywhere in the world. Um, also, in order to get public acceptance. Besides uh, the certification, the biggest hurdle is, of course, to get public acceptance and convince not only the authorities, but the population that we can fly safely and quietly in, in cities. So from the last five years, testing the aircraft in all different conditions, now had an intermediate step, which is um, a vehicle we call B0 internally, which is now leading to the conforming aircraft that we will start testing in July. So it is a long journey. You need several prototypes. You need a lot of testing. But now we are, let's say, at the last mile. It's still super challenging. Um, it's not a walk in the park, uh, and uh, of course we have a lot of uh, challenges, be it in our team, be it, uh, of course, in, in the, the process on the very, very short timeline. And you showed your timeline is a bit more extensive than, than ours. We still believe we can do it faster. Um, and the good thing is, um, I, in the discussion I had with EASA when, when I started last year, about uh, how realistic it, it is to get uh, to the Olympics next year. Um, at the beginning, it was a skeptical, and we went through all the different phases. At the end, we said, it's still feasible. Is it guaranteed? No, not at all, but it's still feasible. So this is still the status. We work like hell. I think it's our, our polar star, because the good thing is it will not move. Uh, so we cannot go internally and say, OK, let's do it a month later or two months later, which is still cool. but. It's not as cool as flying next year in summer here uh, during the Olympic Games. Excellent. Adam. So when I started Archer, the philosophy, I think, was actually pretty different than the other eVTOL companies. And the philosophy was all based around a business case, which was how do we build a vehicle that we can bring to market and make money from? And that was the, the mindset, which was, I think, different than a lot of the other groups which built stuff all around like the technology. And so we kind of had the advantage of starting later, and where a lot of the technology in the industry, like the batteries, for example, just matured. And so it gave us the ability to start with the mindset, thinking about things like a business model. And so not to say that the other groups don't have great business models as well, but it was just the mental framework of how we built the aircraft around that concept. So we started from a very heavy data science approach, and that gave us the ability to zone in on the type of vehicle with speed, range, and payload necessary to build something that could scale. And that enabled us or allowed us to focus on this vehicle that was around urban air mobility, that was around these you know, typical 20, 30, 40 mile trips that we could do back to back. And so that framework um, was the you know, overarching you know, philosophy behind the midnight aircraft, which you, know, you could see right, right behind us. And it was never intended from a, like an MVP concept. It was intended from a vehicle that could get to market and ultimately scale. And so then we started building everything else from that same framework. So we thought, OK, if we're going to go out and build an electric powertrain, how do we build a powertrain that can scale? And so we took a lot of the lessons learned from the automotive industry. And so we said, OK, how do you build these motors that you can build a motor in 30, 60, 90 minutes? How do you build a battery pack that you can build in 10, 15, 20 minutes? Because you start to think about the scaling of this industry, you're going to have to build at rates like that in order to actually scale this stuff up. So all that had to be considered in the original design. So if you look at the Archer team, there's a lot of eVTOL veterans, there's a lot of uh, early EV powertrain veterans. Um, and then there's a lot of folks that have been around and certified big aircraft programs. And so that was a lot of the intent of what we built. So it was all built around the thought behind scaling the business um, and putting pencils down. 
So we're based in Silicon Valley, and one of the things Silicon Valley is sort of known for is not putting your pencils down, and to keep engineering, and to keep building, and building, and building. And so we really wanted to make sure we came from a philosophy that um, said we could bring a economically viable product to market, and we could do that from the very beginning, that was built to scale, um, that could be deployed globally. From a certification perspective, uh, we brought that concept to the FAA. We approached that with the regulator from day one as well. We said, look, everything we're doing here is based around the highest level of safety, but also based around scalability. And so our philosophy was start with the FAA and then ultimately look to expand globally. And so to date, the FAA has been extremely supportive um, and we've had um, a lot of, um, I think, very healthy conversations with other regulators uh, globally, but I do think the FAA has leaned in in a way to work with the companies to come up with frameworks that make sense. And that's what we're currently going through and progressing. Thank you. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about price. So if you remember Uber Elevate, right? The Uber Elevate folks taught us that we should sell our cars because it's going to be cheaper to fly one day. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about pricing. So tell us a little bit, you know, what is the expected pricing of EIS? Um, I'm going to write it down. Um, and then um, how you working to decrease your DOC and ultimately achieve this goal of right hailing prices. And last but not least, who are you targeting at entry into service? Adam, get us started, please. So I, I think actually one of the uh, Uber Elevate founders is here, Nikhil, I just, you know, he's in the audience here. Um, the, the concept for me around pricing all goes back to the concept of building a business model that makes sense where we can make money in this business, where it's not, where we can build an industry because these products are scalable, because they're financeable, because it will be a very expensive journey. So we had to balance keeping all of our direct operating costs as low as absolutely possible. But then we had to balance that against a lot of the unknowns. And I think the biggest unknown when it comes to pricing is going to be landing fees. And so I know a lot of the industry has worked with some of the infrastructure players to help try to convince them to keep the landing fees as low as possible so we can offer a price point that uh, will be scalable to the masses. So I think that's going to be the biggest determination of where uh, pricing actually comes uh, out. Our goal is entry into service into um, routes that are, um, as we talked about, airport to city center, where we can have comparable pricing to rideshare. We know there's no demand. We know people are willing to pay to do that. So the types of routes, if you look at what we talked about, are Manhattan to uh, Newark Liberty International, one of United's big hubs. If you take an Uber today, that'll cost you $100, $120, take you 90 minutes. We would offer a similar price point on a per passenger basis. So I think it's a very good value proposition. I think it's a price point where we can make money as a company. And I think it's a, um, a, a price point where we can actually get adoption. It's a cool product. I think people are, are going to want to take it. We have to make sure though it is really valuable. So it's not even just about the price as much as it is for me as about the experience. How do you create a magical experience that will blow people away every time? If we can do that with a reasonable price, I think the industry has unbelievable uh, ways to scale. I believe at the beginning that it is uh, expensive because as said, landing fees are still high. Um, you need to calculate that, especially in our case at the beginning, we have to pay everything by one single paying customer. We have to pay uh, for um, handling, security, uh, operation, booking, uh, service. All of that has to be paid by one ticket. We simulated all of that so we know exactly what it costs. Um, is this affordable at the beginning? No, um, because it is just um, also a question, how do you calculate in the infrastructure? Will it be subsidized, yes or no? Um, all of these topics go into the calculation. Uh, we will start in Paris, and we will announce it with our partners very soon, um, and we will support the pricing. It will be um, at affordable price, but uh, of course more expensive than a taxi. It's, it's not realistic to believe that in the first year of operation you can already be at a taxi price. Once we go um, to the next model, uh, having a balance of scale, producing more than 100 aircraft a year, 
you can be in, in the range of an expensive rideshare uh, price or a taxi price, and this will be achieved uh, by the end of 26. So this is, is, is realistic, but it needs time, and you need to go to in higher industrialization, higher automation of the production, and uh, this we will achieve by end of 26. Thank you. Klaus. Yeah, we, we say we want to democratize, uh, and this only works when you, when you scale and when you have lowest operating cost. And when we look at our set of requirements, uh, top number one definitively is safety. Uh, it's all nothing without safety, and safety has to be a given. Uh, and the second one was operating cost. The third one is scalability. Scalability in two ways, range scalability, uh, but also production scalability. What makes an aircraft easy uh, and cheap to operate, uh, you have to do it at the outset from the design. If you discover late in the design that your operating cost is too high, you are just where you are and it's very difficult to recover. So uh, what makes an aircraft easy to operate? For sure, low energy cost uh, means high aerodynamic efficiency, high range and high transport capacity because the denominator is just a bigger one high availability of the aircraft, so uh, low interference from uh, out, uh, out times of maintenance, lowest maintenance cost, high daily utilization. This is why our aircraft is physically very simple, and, and we are targeting that this aircraft is going to operate 360 days a year, and it's, it's operating six hours per day. It will have basically no interruption from maintenance, and the maintenance cost will be very low. When you sum this all up, and I agree, there is the unknown and not under our influence necessarily component uh, of, of ATC, of landing fees, but what we can do, uh, what can be our contribution to the aircraft, uh, we try to do the very best. And our target is, and that's by the way what all customers are telling me, when you get out at about $3 per pax kilometer, you are in a very, very competitive environment. Our design target is even to go below. And if we want to scale this business, and if we want to build hundreds of aircraft or thousands of aircraft in the future, I think it will only work if you come to this price target that I've just mentioned. Thank you. Brian. Yeah, a lot's been said, so I'll be relatively quick. Um, one of the things we know from the history of the airline industry and the ride-sharing industry is that markets determine price. We don't determine price. Markets determine price, and what we have a lot of control over are cost. So it's another way of saying, we're designing the aircraft right now to have very low costs, and we get that from all the simplicity and redundancy and all the rest that we just talked about. We also get this from autonomy and our ability to scale the network. So we really think about the total cost of operating a network in a, in a, in a city or in a region. That to us is the important cost to look at over time. And once we have that base of cost, we will be able to provide dynamic pricing into markets for particular times and particular routes. Uh, within that market. And so ultimately, the markets will determine the price at the particular time. We, of course, like everyone, would love to get costs down uh, so that we can have this to be ac accessed by the most people possible. We think that that will come through scalability and ultimately reducing costs. But, uh, but initially, I think you'll see a very dynamic pricing environment as these aircraft come along. Thank you. So now the next round of questions are individual questions for each one of you. Um, so let, let's start with, with Brian. So with WISC, your strategy has been to go directly to autonomy, right? And that's one of the differentiators. However, autonomy means foregoing an early entry into service. So can you get us through the decision-making process that led to autonomy first? And the other part, how you plan to get there, considering that right now there is a lack of cert regulations as far as autonomy? Yeah, so the first thing I would do is I would disagree strongly with the last part of your question. Um, so there is a misnomer in our industry that there is a, quote, no certification path for autonomous airplanes today. And that is not true. The certification path for, to type certify the airplane is the exact same certification path that every VTOL company is working its way through. So we're working way, in the FAA right now, we're working through a 2117B process. Uh, and we will type certify the airplane in the same way that the other aircraft in the space are being type certified. Now, the question for us is not can we type certify the airplane. The question for us is can we operate the type certified airplane? Can we get the waivers and exemptions that are required against today's operational rules to be able to operate that aircraft? 
And that's the additional piece that we have to bring along, along with qualifying the supervisors, ultimately, that will sit on the ground. So we see a viewpoint and a way to get there. Um, we will not be first, as I said, but we will also not be late. We will be soon. So we've said that we're, we intend to do this this decade. We, we believe that we have a, a viewpoint on how we're going to get there this decade. And, um, and so why did we do it? So we said, ultimately, that this market is interesting to us if we could do it in a safe way, and we think that that will come through automation, and if we could do it in a scalable way, and we think that that will come through automation as well. So that's the rationale for why we did it. Um, the, uh, maybe the last thing I'll say is, is um, you know, we think that by starting in the FAA, but having this kind of viewpoint for how we'll have transferability around the world, will make for a system that um, you know, we, we really have to think about these things up front. Uh, our viewpoint is that it's very difficult to start with a pilot and all the rationale that goes into supporting a pilot on board and, and allocating functions to the pilot on board uh, the aircraft, and then ultimately taking those away from the pilot over time and getting to an autonomous aircraft. Some of the considerations for how to safely, at the levels of safety that we're talking about in the FAA, and ultimately that will be transferable to Yasser around the world, some of the implications for reaching those safety levels go so deep into the avionics system, so deep into the actuation, so deep into the powertrain, so deep into the offboard systems, that it's very difficult after the fact to place those considerations into the aircraft, and it may be a new type certification program. So we know this is risky. We know it's ambitious. That's the point. So we will succeed or fail on the basis of our ability to certify the airplane. We've been clear about that. We don't have a backup. We're doing the thing. And, um, and we're proud to be out there and saying we're ambitious and trying to achieve this. And if we succeed, we think it'll be great for the industry. We think that it'll be great for others uh, in this industry and in the large airplane industry. And, um, and if we fail, well, we'll go down trying. And hopefully, we'll make some good progress. Thank you. Yep. Klaus. Through the history of your company, you've changed the entry into service market a few times. Um, and the latest one is the sales to Hanet toward individual business aviation. So can you explain the rationale behind this pivot and what does it mean for the Lilium Jet? Yeah, maybe it's a bit of a perception issue. Uh, the mission uh, that was uh, formulated by the founders was uh, a mission-free flight for everyone has never changed on Lilium. Uh, and that's what we are striving for, and that's what, what I said before. Um, we had the idea initially to also operate our plane, to, so to provide a service, and I, I'm not saying we have given up on it, but we have put it very much to the right. Why so? Uh, there is enough complexity to design uh, and build and ramp up uh, such an aircraft. Uh, it's maybe overcharging a small startup company to say, I'm adding to this complexity the complexity of setting up an airline and operating aircraft. More than that, it's very capital intense. And the last thing is, I think you have to take a choice. Will I be an OEM and will I sell my aircraft or will I operate? You cannot do the same at the same time because then you are in competition with your customers and that never works out. Regarding the high net worth individuals premium market, uh, I wouldn't say we have elected to go there. It's more the market has elected us to go there. Uh, why so? Because uh, many of those individuals found, hey, your aircraft is just looking, sorry colleagues, uh, more sexy than the other ones. We love it best. And it's designed to the highest safety standards. And those people are very keen on safety. On the other side, they are less price sensitive. And they are ready to pay upfront a higher bill. Uh, when we look into how you generate cash, this is clearly for a sudden early cash generation, I think, the best market to tap into. However, when you see the overall cash flows coming from sales of aircraft, but also from serving an aircraft that is under very high utilization, the mass market, the shuttle market is clearly the place to be. So I believe for the first one to two years, uh, our customer base will be dominated by premium market segment. But on the mid to long term, we believe 85 to 90% will be the so-called shuttle market. Thank you. Dirk, so I close my slides with the hopefully what we'll see next year. So um, in, we know that, as you mentioned, it's a challenge, right? There is no working around the fact that the Olympic will take place. Um, so 
tell us a little bit, you know, how are all the elements of the ecosystem coming together to make this a reality? And then do I have to save 300 euros or 100 euros to fly it? Um, yeah, what we're doing is since years already, since we started the discussion with Paris and our partner ADP to prepare for, for the operation here in Paris. It's, it's a different environment. It's, it's much more complicated than flying in a regional area. Um, we have uh, defined by now um, the routes that will be announced today. We have, of course, also looked at safety precautions, safety buffers on the battery side. Everything is aligned between DGAC and EASA, so there's a very close communication in order to make sure that it will be a safe operation. The roads have been chosen accordingly, making sure that we use existing um, helicopter lines and uh, lines uh, that are not flying over very populated areas. So ensuring that we have a step-by-step -step approach in order to demonstrate to population it's safe, it's quiet, and sustainable. So with that, we also have, for example, defined emergency landing sites in order to, to have the security. If anything happens, we have enough sites where we can also safely land. And as said, uh, even if we would lose one or two motors, we, we can safely land. So there's a lot of safety built in. As said, it will be certified to the same standards as an Airbus A320 or Boeing 737. Um, so this is, um, these are the steps. We, we start, uh, of course, doing several steps in parallel. We, we need to get the MRO. We will um, uh, get the AOC uh, for fixed-wing aircraft in late summer this year. We start uh, to apply for an ATO because we need to start training the pilots uh, end of the year, beginning of next year, we estimate that we need six months to train the pilots for operation next year in summer. So we have all the elements lined up. Uh, it's not fantasy anymore. It's, it's now hard work to get all these steps done, but it's not, it's not rocket science. It's uh, just hard work. Thank you. It's evidence. It's even worse than rocket science. Um, Adam, so um, the, you guys have made a significant progress to date, right? Many times people have doubted you, you've come through. Um, you have an, a, a very aggressive uh, search schedule. So guide us through, you know, what are the challenges that you're expecting on your way to certification, as well as, you know, the challenges that you have overcome to get to where you are. Right. First I'll say, Klaus, I agree. Your plane looks really good. It is. That is a nice, the Lillian plane is very beautiful, but even broader than that, I even think the European guys look really good too. I mean, I've been noticing they have the nice flowered imprint. I mean, I was just thinking I gotta step up my, uh, my game there. So uh, definitely a shout out on the design side. You guys have done a great job. Um, on the certification path, um, cert is definitely hard. And it's hard because we're trying to show that we can operate at the highest levels of safety with an aircraft that's new and there are some new concepts. But the good news is a lot of the plane is actually very similar to a lot of the regulation that already exists. So some of the new systems, like the electric powertrain, as an example, is where we'll spend a lot of time creating um, a lot of uh, new insights and new ways to validate that the vehicles are very safe. Um, one of the things that I, I, I thought was a, just a great you know, kind of moment for the industry was when you know, Billy Nolan, the FAA administrator stepped down and he came and joined Archer. But it wasn't really just about Archer. I think that was an industry um, you know, kind of vote of confidence where you know, presumably the administrator has a lot of insight into certification programs and the likelihood and speed of, how, of when these programs will come to life. And so actually joining the industry, I thought was a, just a really big vote of confidence and was, uh, w w was certainly a positive one. The reality is it's just time to get through CERT at this point. So we've largely completed the engineering. We've started standing up all the manufacturing. Um, we've got the teams in place to do it. And now it's just going through the times where you know, we're getting the, you know, the comments on the airworthiness all dispositioned, which will roll through the means of compliance and the, and the CERT plans, and ultimately allow us to start test for credit. And so I think it's really just a timing thing at this point. And um, the FAA has been um, you know, very cooperative in working with us. And so I do see a pretty straightforward path. And I do think the ability to get to market um, in 2025 to start operations is viable and doable. And I do think it's going to shock the world. I mean, every time we you know, uh, 
you know, tell people what we're going to do and the plane we're going to bring. Um, it does tend to uh, cause a lot of commotion, but we have delivered um, and we will continue to, del to deliver. And um, I do think 2025 will be a huge year uh, for the industry. Thank you. So I think we have, uh, we have barely a little, bit, a little bit of time for one question. And I think uh, the most interesting was most conops call for VFR flights. Uh, how will these impact your usability as far as you know, how much you can fly? And when do you expect to go to IFR? Adam, do you want to get? I, I think as the industry really starts, you know, it's not going to start with 1,000 planes in the air operating 16 hours a day, you know, daytime and nighttime and all types of conditions. I think it's going to start with several vehicles, point-to-point -point routes. And so there's a lot of things that are just going to have to happen over time where some of these things will look scary from uh, limiting factors. Maybe it's regulation, maybe it's consumer confidence. But I think the reality is the, the biggest limiter to us scaling is going to just be getting the reps in where we understand how to provide a truly you know, epic experience because it certainly has the opportunity to do that. And so I think we'll start relatively slow and there'll be a dozen aircraft flying you know, several missions a day. There'll be a lot of, I think, press and media around it because the experience can be so good. Over time, the regulation will start to become you know, um, you know, much more understanding of what we're doing and everything will loosen up and allow for higher scale operations. So that's the framework that I use to think about it and maybe it's, a, it's just a high level approach, but that's what I believe will ultimately happen. Yeah, we will end into the service uh, next year. Um, the first two years, this is exactly as you described. It will be step-by-step -step approach, increasing the amount of routes, uh, vehicles, get the public acceptance before we can scale. This is then ready when we bring the next uh, generation of aircraft into the market, end of 26. And in parallel right now, we, we work on the cargo drone, our Volo drone, in order to understand automation, autonomous flying, exactly as WISC does, so that we at a given point can take that over into the next generation aircraft. Regarding, um, yes, we will start VFR day, um, because it's the most easiest uh, to start with, um, and next generation will be then VFR night, and uh, IFR is, of course, the target. So can I guarantee it will be already in the next generation 26? No. We have to see really how fast we progress. And also if there's a need, because it adds weight. Uh, at the end, the biggest uh, challenge for, for next generation vehicle is weight. It's, uh, and this is in you know, a closer relationship with the, the power density of the better generations available. And, so do we need really to evaluate, is the benefit um, high enough to accelerate the IFR track, or should we rather continue to do VFR day and night while we wait for maybe the next generation of batteries afterwards? So. Klaus. Yeah, our target is uh, high usability and operability right from the beginning. Uh, we cannot have everything at the same time, so we had to make our choices. And our choices have clearly been uh, payload and range at the beginning to have an aircraft that is really meaningful to operate. Uh, next point is uh, meaningful operations under different weather conditions, be it very cold, be it icing, be it very hot, uh, different wind conditions, gust. All of this will be available by EIS and, and TC. Uh, but it will be VFR. Uh, and uh, within two years then we are striving to go also into IFR. Uh, this was our own perception to, to maximize the usability, but we had intense discussion with a variety of customers, and the development sequence we are coming up with is completely aligned with our customer base, so what they would appreciate the most, what do they need first, what may they need last. So we are starting off with VFR, but we have a very good, I would say, envelope uh, in, in terms of usability of the plane, and we will expand to IFR very fast. Right. Here's a fun example of why when I say autonomy and scalability are, are interesting and work together, is this very small and practical example of VFR and IFR. There is no pilot on board an autonomous airplane, so we never fly VFR. We do not fly under visual flight rules because there is no pilot that can comply with visual flight rules. So we always fly on an IFR flight plan. We designed the aircraft to be able to fly in reasonable weather conditions, whether or not it's a blue sky outside or a foggy day outside. We have the same flight conditions for the aircraft because there's no human on board to look outside the aircraft to fly the aircraft in those conditions using visual flight rules. So IFR from day one, 
And we think that the ConOps that we released last year kind of lays out how we think IFR uh, enables us to operate in uh, high density areas. The recent FA ConOps validated our ideas on that and ultimately introduced the idea of corridors and digital flight rules, which we will take advantage of in our autonomous aircraft. And that's just one tiny example of the thinking that goes into an autonomous aircraft and what it means to be able to deliver something at scale. Gentlemen, I would like to thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work you're doing for the industry. Please, let's give a hand to this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to take a short break, and our next session with Airbus is at 10.50.